I'm going to present some work that has been done in the last few years uh, together with uh, uh, my ex-colleagues and uh, collaborators, uh, Alexis de Kirnage, uh, Ka Kwong Ngo, and uh, Ingmar Lan. Uh, so the, the, topic of, uh, the topic of this talk is uh, uh, sporadic communication, and, and I want to have this motivation, uh, motivational slide to explain why I want to look into this problem. Um, at, at the top, I picture uh, the position where we stand a few years ago. People were saying, okay, I want to have a control loop to control a robot, and I need to update 1,000 times per second the position of my robotic arm. And this needs to be fed back you know, on a regular basis to the control algorithm. Uh, if you want to do this, uh, you are typically in what we call ultra-reliable low-latency low communications. Uh, meanwhile, we have realized that you don't really need to update 1,000 times per second the position of a robotic arm because it's quite predictable. The laws of physics are such that you can relatively well predict it over short term. And, and the, the more intelligent way of doing this is that on the, uh, on the side of the control algorithm, you have a local model for what the robot is doing. And on the side of the robot, you have a local model for... Uh, for what the control algorithm is doing. And you only need to communicate whenever these two models start to diverge. So for example, when a robotic arm hits something unexpected, uh, uh, then you really need to send a message. Uh, but if, if it's just uh, moving as predicted, you don't need to send anything. So this brings me to the point that I think most modern applications are going to follow this scheme where we only require sporadic communications. So we, see, we still have the low latency constraint, we still have the reliability constraint, but what uh, goes out of the picture is the uh, connection oriented uh, sort of design where you are going to send many, many uh, packets uh, successively. Um, so, um, so this will actually motivate the assumptions of, uh, of my work. So I'm going to consider um, uh, a model where uh, I have a multi-point to point uh, channel, so it's, it's random access. I have uh, a potentially very large number of devices. Some of them transmit, some of them do not transmit, and, and the receiver doesn't know in advance who is transmitting at, at a given point. And I denote a case of A, the number of uh, uh, active devices. Uh, so the regime of interest, and I think it's uh, uh, a common interest here, is small payloads, uh, many users, and a high level of contention. Okay, because if you don't have a high level of contention, it's easy. It's not interesting. Uh, so I think we need to, to question the, the classical assumptions uh, on top of which we have built the, the physical layer so far, in particular when it comes to coordination. Uh, to, to the availability of, of channel state information um, and, and synchronization. Uh, so if, if I look again uh, towards the past at, at you know, how did we design um, uh, communication uh, protocols in the, in the past at the physical layer, this was really based on a divide and conquer uh, approach where uh, first there is some coordination. So we assign some uh, most of, very often, orthogonal pilots uh, to every users. We use these pilots to estimate the CSI. Once we have a CSI estimate, we can do uh, linear equal equalization, multi-user equalization. Uh, on top of this, we have some uh, power control, uh, uh, closed loop, some rate selection algorithms. Uh, we have synchronization. Uh, we have uh, compensation for the carrier frequency offsets. Uh, we may need to grant some resources to users. And once you have done all of this, you end up with an equivalent AWGN channel. And then you can start to do coding. So my point is, this may actually makes sense when you have a lot of uh, successive packets to transmit. But if you have a single packet per, per device to transmit, it doesn't make sense to, uh, to have all of this uh, uh, overhead. So I'm, I'm going to, to try and design something where we can get rid of uh, all of these um, uh, constraints. Uh, so, so let me introduce quickly the, the channel model that, that uh, I will consider. So I have said that uh, I have a, a random set of my users which uh, become active. Uh, this is not known by the receiver. 
I consider here uh, first a, a, a block fading channel. Uh, capital T is my block length. I, I assume that my users are block synchronous at, at this point in the talk, at least. Um, I assume that I have a single input, multiple output uh, channel with uh, capital M receive antennas. So if I look at the channel state for one user, it's going to be a vector with uh, with M uh, complex coefficients. Um, and and if I look at uh, from the if we, if I look at the the signal uh, that I receive from the receiver point of view, what I get is a superposition of uh, the sequences S sub K transmitted by uh, by all all my users. Uh, and there is uh, uh, since I have a single input multiple output channel uh, on every antenna, I observe uh, a weighted um, uh, a weighted version of of the transmitted sequence. So, uh, so this can be written as an outer product, uh, outer product of uh, the two vectors, and this this is a matrix. I can choose to vectorize this matrix, and it will become uh, the chronicle product that that you have here on the right. So this is very trivial, but actually I'm going to to build the rest of the talk on on these these notations. So I I insist on this. So what I'm saying here is that I have a superposition of signals from all my users. And what I receive is the conductor products of the transmitted sequences, SK, and the um, uh, the channel uh, responses, uh, H sub K. That's it. Um, so of course, if you only observe this superposition, uh, uh, you know, it, it's a pretty hard problem because if you look at the sum, I don't know the number of terms. I don't know SK because this is the data I want to uh, detect. And I don't know HK. So I know nothing, <laughs> and I would like to recover at least the SK. Um, so it doesn't look like a well-posed problem at this point, quite obviously. And what I will do, the object of this talk is I will try to find a good way to design my sequence SK that will allow me to separate this, uh, to separate the signals coming from uh, all these, these uh, uh, active users. So there, you know, there, there are a number of uh, uh, solutions uh, when it comes to uh, to random access. Uh, the first one is uh, TDMA, so you assign one slot per users, and whether they use it or not, uh, this is not very spectrally efficient. Uh, then you have uh, slotted aloha, and then what I have pictured here is is a collision because my my two users actually choose the same slot, and then and then you you lose the packet. Uh, it can get a little bit uh, smarter. You can have slotted a little with, with some coding on top of it. So for, in, in that case, you, you may want to do some, some repetitions. Each user is going to transmit multiple times the same packet or packets with redundancy. And then you can do uh, interference cancellation uh, between, the, between the, the copies of these packets. Uh, an alternative to this is to um, First, to transmit some, some preamble, so this is what is pictured on the, the top right. Uh, there is a preamble which can be like a per user um, uh, sequence. And then this is used for activity detection and channel estimation. And once you have this, you have a channel estimate, you can do coherent detection. Um, you can do something a little bit similar, which consists in uh, transmitting. Uh, only uh, sequences from finite dictionary, and to consider this sub sub slot as a, a, a compressed sensing problem. So uh, if you do if you do that, uh, what you do is you effectively turn your fading channel into an equivalent R channel, and then uh, you uh, uh, you can do um, you can do some coding then for for this for this binary uh, channel. Uh, so what I will discuss next is, is none of this. I uh, will discuss the, uh, the last option, which I will call the, the tensor-based modulation. And in that option, uh, every active user is using all the available resources to, to transmit. Uh, in particular, or it's a pity because we are missing the title, uh, this uh, slide is about unsourced uh, random access. Uh, which is a which is a, a scheme that was suggested in, in, in a paper by by Polyansky that was mentioned already, and the the idea is that all the users uh, all the all the users are going to use uh, the exact same transmission codebook, and by codebook I mean 
the whole sequence. So, for example, if uh, if you assign to the users individual uh, preambles, this is not unsourced, right? So, in the unsourced paradigm, you have no way to know which user has transmitted the packet. Uh, so, this 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 may sound a little bit crazy at first. Uh, so, you are basically in a situation where uh, the best thing that the decoder can do is to uh, spit out a list of the transmitted messages. Uh, but at this stage, you don't, you don't know from which user these messages are, are coming from. At first sight, it doesn't look like a great idea. Uh, on, in, in fact, if you think a little bit harder about it, uh, it's pretty smart because this greatly simplifies the decoder. The decoder only needs to focus on, uh, uh, on the number of active users. So this greatly reduces the, the scale of the problem that the physical layer decoder is solving. And second, the fact that um, the, the code book is not user specific. Actually, this is not really an issue because once you have uh, decoded the packet, you can decide to include the user ID within the payload, right? So this means that for the physical layer, you design your decoder following the unsourced principle and you get low complexity decoder. But for the layers above, you actually recover the user ID because you have encoded it within the packet. And, and this is this is pretty cheap because if you have capital K users in total, you just need log K, log two of K uh, bits uh, from, from the payload, which is uh, uh, probably not a big price to, to pay. Uh, if you put a, uh, an ID in the in the payload, it's not really a source so far because this code is specific. correct. So it's a, so what I mean by this is it's unsourced uh, from the point of view of the the physical layer decoder because the physical layer decoder does not try to estimate the user ID. Okay, okay so you don't use any ID to do the decoding. Exactly. So this information is there, but uh, the the decoder doesn't try to uh, to 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 detect it. Uh, okay, so the scheme I will describe is actually an example of unsourced uh, random access. Uh, so you can see that we're missing the titles. Maybe I can move this. Okay. <laughs> okay, well. Need two hands. Yeah. Okay, that's better. Yeah. Okay, um, so so the the solution I will uh, describe next is based on some very basic tensor algebra. So I will spend a couple of minutes on on tensor algebra. So I'm sure everyone is familiar with matrix algebra, and in particular, you probably know that if you take uh, the outer product between two vectors a and b, uh, you obtain matrix. So you you have two one-dimensional uh, variables and you take the outer product and you, you end up with a two-dimensional uh, matrix, which is a rank one matrix. And if you vectorize this rank one matrix, it can be written as, as a chronic product. So this is this is the matrix case on top. For tensors, we simply generalize this. Instead of considering the outer product between two vectors, we can consider the outer product between any number of, the, of, of vectors it can be in, in that example it's it's showing three vectors but it can be more um, and this uh, this also defines what we call a rank one tensor okay um, so so far it's very similar the uh, between the, the matrix case and the tensor case uh, things are very similar um, Things get a little bit different. Did I skip something? No. Okay. So um, if you uh, if you give me uh, an arbitrary tensor, I can try to decompose it into a sum of uh, rank one tensor components, and this is known as a, a canonical polyadic decomposition. Or it can be done using an algorithm called Parapack. And what this does is that it starts from uh, an arbitrary tensor, which is a, a sum. Uh, uh, a sum of rank one components, and it tries to recover individually the rank one components. Okay, uh, of course, up to a permutation on the order because the order cannot be recovered from from the sum. Um, 
and the minimum number of terms uh, which are needed to uh, express a given tensor is called the tensor rank. Okay. So uh, why am I telling you this? Uh, the um, so if if you give me an arbitrary tensor, uh, the it will probably have a pretty high rank. Actually, the rank is given by uh, the formula, which is on top. And what is what this is showing is that the rank of the tensor is going to be, roughly speaking, uh, the product of the dimensions divided by the sum of the dimensions. This is very different from the matrix case, where the rank of a generic matrix is the minimum between the number of rows and columns. Here we have the product divided by the sum. So it can be it can be quite large uh, quickly. Um, so this is for a generic tensor, and if you give me a tensor which is uh, uh, which has some generic rank, uh, there is almost surely a unique way to decompose this tensor into rank one terms. So this is extremely interesting. Uh, this this unicity of the decomposition, and I'm going to exploit this to uh, in, in my in my random access problem. I'm going to exploit this to allow my decoder to separate the signals coming from the different users. Essentially, what I will do is I will associate uh, uh, the signals to, from each user to a rank one tensor. Uh, so, so that, that's how I do it. Uh, I will decide that the sequence S sub K transmitted by a given user, uh, I, will, I will constrain it to be equal to uh, the chronicle product of a few vectors is uh, x1 uh, to xd. And these x vectors are actually the information bearing components of my modulation. So this is it. Actually, uh, this is the core of my talk. <laughs> this chronicle product equation. If, uh, if on the transmitter side, I construct my modulation like this, and I encode my information in, in the vectors x1 to xd, uh, what happens at the receiver side is uh, is what is shown here. Uh, I still have uh, I still have uh, one outer product which uh, which comes from my channel model, uh, and then I have this bunch of terms which come from the, the structure that I impose at the um, at the transmitter side. So essentially, what my receiver observes is a tensor that has a rank corresponding to the number of active users. Um, and the last mode of the tensor contains the um, uh, my channel uh, realizations, and the first modes of the tensor uh, contain the uh, information bearing symbols. Uh, so, um, so how do we make practical use of this? Uh, of course, typically there is noise, and sometimes it's Gaussian, sometimes not. It doesn't matter here so much. Uh, so, uh, from the receiver point of view, I take my receive signal and I try to find, I try to approximate it with a sum of rank one tensors. So this is known as the, this is what the Parafac algorithm does, and so we have off-the-shelf uh, solutions for, uh, for for doing this. Um, so, so in fact, what is happening here is that I try to approximate my receive signal by a sum of rank one tensors. Um, and this uh, this optimization problem is uh, is not taking into account the fact that my x vectors they uh, typically come from a discrete uh, constellation. Okay, and, uh, usually you I mean we, we we use discrete constellations to to encode data, and here it's also the case. But at this stage in my receiver, I, I relax my problem. And I just try to do this tensor decomposition in a continuous space because it's easier. Um, so I, I do this uh, using the, the Parafac algorithm. Uh, so this, um, if there is little or no noise, what I will get at the output of, of this decomposition is that um, I will get the correct rank one terms up to reordering. Uh, so this is, uh, this is what the, the permutation sigma here is showing. Um, and of course, the uh, uh, the, the 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 rank one terms here may be unique, 
but there is still a scalar ambiguity because of course I can multiply x1 by coefficient alpha and I can multiply x2 by one over alpha and you get the same term, right? So there is, uh, there is an inherent uh, um, scalar ambiguity on each of these uh, uh, x vectors. So effectively what I have done by uh, doing a Kronecker, Kronecker product at the transmitter side and then doing the, uh, the CPD decomposition at the receiver is that I have created a bunch of uh, parallel equivalent channels uh, that map vector x, uh, x11 in that example to x1 sigma1 in that example. Um, and I know that uh, in if there is little noise, uh, this x1 sigma1 is going to be equal to x11 up to a scalar coefficient. And this up to a scalar coefficient is exactly the definition of a non-coherent channel uh, and point-to-point -point single user, right? And this is good because we have uh, we we know how to we know how to design good modulations for this point-to-point uh, -point, um, SISO channel. So I'm just going to reuse some existing designs for for that uh, for that part. Yes. Why? Why this uh, um, interleave, let's say, appears at the vector level and not at the component level? Why? Sorry? So, so there is this uh, sigma that is a reordering, right? Yes. Why, why that reordering happens at the vector level, right, and not at the component level? OK, the sigma comes from the fact that if you take a sum such as this one and you, you swap the order of, of two terms in the sum, you get the same sum. Right, so it's just the the, the uh, commutativity of of the sum. Uh, now, if you swap the order of the first uh, vector in the Kronecker product and the second vector in the Kronecker product, you get a completely different Kronecker product. So it it so this is why um, uh, there is no there is no ambiguity on the order of x one and x two. You know, if if you consider Actually, maybe it's better if you consider this kind of representation. X1 represents one mode of a tensor. It's like one special mode. X2 represents another special mode, which, which uh, uh, it, it means something completely different. It has even different dimension in general, right? So th there is no risk that these get mixed. So the, the sigma is really just this, the ambiguity due to the fact that the sum uh, uh, is, is commutative. Um, okay, so this is really great because now I have uh, I, I, what I'm saying here. What I'm saying here is that I can more or less for free separate the signals coming from all all, all the all the users, uh, and and then for each of these vectors uh, with their equivalent channels, I do um, I, I code for the the SISO non coherent coherent channel, uh, and for this. Uh, either you can send one reference symbol and then some QAM modulation, or you can rely directly on some vector code books, uh, which is uh, something I also worked on. And this is actually what, what I chose to do here. But uh, there is basically a lot of freedom into how to design the modulation inside each mode of, uh, of the tensor. Uh, so once you have separated all these uh, vectors, you can do uh, you can demodulate them one by one, uh, which is pretty low complexity. Um, so, okay, I probably should watch the time. Good, okay. Um, so um, we, we have done an analysis of the number of uh, uh, complex degrees of freedom, which, uh, which are achievable using these kind of schemes. And since the design is really simple, uh, the DOF analysis is also, is also very simple. So if, if you don't know the degrees of freedom is the, uh, when, when you take uh, the um, SNR to infinity and you look at uh, how capacity scales um, so it's usually something times log one plus SNR, and the, the pre-log factor is uh, represents the, the degrees of freedom. Uh, so here, if I look at the degrees of freedom that I can uh, communicate over uh, one vector x i k, 
since it's non coherent, I lose one degree of freedom to estimate the channel. And then uh, I have, uh, if my vector has dimension ti, I have ti minus one degree of freedom for this vector um, uh, xik. So if I sum this over the small d vectors that one new one user is transmitting, I, I get I get this sum. So this is the achievable degrees of freedom per user. And if I want to uh, to have the aggregate uh, degrees of freedom among all the users, I get this term times the number of active users, knowing that the number of active users is limited by uh, the maximum rank of the tensor that I can identify. And we have, uh, we have formulas for this. Uh, so I can, I can uh, so, okay, here, here, here is a, the full formula. I don't think it's very interesting to, um, to, to go through this. Uh, what's interesting to notice though, is that this formula involves the number of receive antennas uh, on top of involving uh, the um, the parameters of my tensor modulation. So this shows actually that if we increase the number of receive antennas, we also increase the degrees of freedom that that can be achieved by by this scheme. Um, it's interesting to compare this uh, degrees of freedom to some bounds. Uh, so here I will consider the the cooperative bound. So let's say that all my users would magically be able to uh, to coordinate. Uh, so instead of having KA users, I have a single user with KA antennas. Um, in that case, uh, the uh, the non-coherent uh, uh, channel has uh, has degrees of freedom uh, as given by by this formula. So um, so I'm going to to plot a few of these uh, degrees of freedom. So. I will take a couple of minutes to describe this figure because it contains a lot of information. The, the vertical axis is the uh, the sum the, the sum DOF per channel use. So I have divided by my total block length um, capital T. Uh, the um, the dotted line here is the the cooperative bound. Uh, so it's it's not exactly equal to the number of receive antennas uh, because it's the non coherent case. So I need to consider that uh, I need to spend some time to learn the channel. So uh, uh, otherwise, uh, in the coherent case, this this bond would be, would be this cooperative bond would be equal to the number of the minimum of transmit and receive antennas. Uh, so so this is my bound, and then uh, each of these segments here they correspond to one possible configuration of my tensor modulation. So uh, the total length, uh, the total block length is, is uh, capital T is fixed here. And I can try many ways. You, when you take the Kronecker product, the, the dimension of the result is the product of the dimension of the individual vectors. So uh, for, for a given uh, total block length, I can find many ways to factorize my, um, uh, my total block into, um, in, into, the, into Kronecker products. And for each of these configurations, I will get one of these segments. Uh, the um, uh, the rightmost um, uh, part of the segment represents the maximum number of active users. So, for example, if I if I have a tensor that has dimension thirty two by thirty two, which corresponds the product corresponds to thousand and twenty four um, symbols. Uh, the maximum number of users that uh, I can discriminate, at least at infinite SNR, is uh, something around uh, 450, let's say. Um, and in case I have less active users than this maximum number of active users, I will. This means I will operate somewhere in this uh, in this segment. So the the slope of each segment corresponds to the per user degrees of freedom. Um, so we see that uh, the, at least this, this DOF analysis shows that there is a trade-off uh, depending on uh, how we choose the dimensions of the, the tensor, how we factorize the block length T. Um, we, okay. uh, we can achieve uh, various trade-offs between maximum number of users and, um, uh, and, and per user uh, degrees of freedom. Uh, here is the same plot with uh, 10 receive antennas. And what we are seeing here is that 
the maximum number of users has been reduced and um, uh, and, and we also achieve uh, lower uh, some some DOF uh, across these these transmissions. Uh, one question that I've been asked is uh, why why you do all these all these things? Why do you want to have five hundred users contending for for resources? Why don't you just break your resources into ten uh, ten pools, let's say, and each user picks a pool, and then you can implement your tensor based modulation inside each of these uh, ten pools. So if you um, if, if if you do this and you can apply the same uh, DOF formulas. Uh, this actually shows that uh, there is a net loss in the number of achievable degrees of freedom uh, that uh, uh, that we have to to suffer if we if we don't ex exploit all the resources as uh, one single uh, one single block. Um, okay, I have okay, I have a bunch of simulations results. I, I'm not sure it's really important to to go through. Um, all of this, uh, maybe I can I can stick to this one. One one very relevant uh, uh, performance criterion is the the minimum uh, EB over N naught, which is required uh, for uh, for detection of uh, um, in that case ninety percent of the users, um, and and we so it's interesting because. Uh, this remains relatively uh, stable when you increase the number of users and suddenly it breaks down. Um, so what, what we are seeing here is that in, in, in this configuration, uh, we have uh, here the black block length is uh, 3,200. 3, uh, we have 50 receive antennas and we can simulate up to 650 active users. Um, and they have a payload, uh, where's the payload? I think the payload is about 100 bits per user. So it's really a very large number of bits per user. Uh, the spectral efficiency in that example is uh, uh, close to 20 bits per channel use, which is, uh, uh, which is quite high. Uh, okay, maybe I will skip. I mean, I will, I will briefly mention this. Uh, until now, I have been discussing um, a block fading model. Uh, now, we wondered how this scheme can be applied to uh, something more realistic, such as OFDM. And we, uh, in particular, OFDM, when you have uh, not exactly uh, synchronous um, uh, users. Um, so, so this means the, the channel is not, is not a flat, strictly speaking. And we realized that there is a very interesting phenomenon that happens, uh, a very interesting interaction between the, um, uh, the the Fourier um, uh, the Fourier transform and the tensor product, which means that uh, the effect of the channel, uh, it, the, the multiplicative effect of the channel, which is related to uh, the timing of set, can be also written as uh, as a low rank tensor, and this means that I can still uh, use my scheme and separate my users even if my channel is not. Uh, uh, is not block fading strictly, but in fact has a linear phase ramp uh, for each user. So this is a very interesting uh, property of this of this modulation. I'm not going to go uh, uh, through all of this. Uh, so in in conclusion, uh, I, I think this this type of approach uh, I call it multilinear spreading because it's really a kind of uh, spreading approach. It's in fact it's a little bit similar to CDMA except that instead of spreading with a fixed code per user, you spread with more data, right? And it, it, at first sight, you don't really see why this would be decodable, but in fact, it is decodable. Um, what I think what is really interesting is that here we perform the user separation over continuous variables. So this means that we don't, I mean, we, we don't explicitly, we, we do estimate the channel, but we don't use this for equalization. So uh, we, uh, the the uh, the tensor decomposition actually performs the multi-user equalization, and then uh, you are left with a bunch of single-user channels for which you can uh, use any kind of modulation and any type of code that that you'd like. Um, interestingly, in this method, uh, we don't really rely on any prior channel uh, channel information. So of course there is no CSI the receiver, but we don't assume anything known about the statistics 
I don't even assume anything about the channel correlation. I mean, there, there are very few assumptions here. Uh, of, I mean, yeah, of course, the channels should not be completely equal or something, you know, something really freaky, then it, it would break down, obviously. Um, so because of this simplicity, it's relatively easy to uh, to study. For, for example, the, the DOF analysis was very, very straightforward. Uh, it's very easy to to study and to um, uh, and to extend. Um, and and finally, I would like to uh, to say that I, I mean I have presented these results already a few times, and some people were like, okay, they they they, they did not really understand the, the tensor aspects, and uh, uh, I I agree that this is not this is not a trivial um, uh, thing to implement. Uh, so recently, I have put online uh, some some proof of concept uh, Python code that that does exactly what uh, what I have just described. Uh, uh, construct this modulation, add some noise, decompose the tensor, demap them. So in in that in that very simple code at the moment, there is no uh, there is no coding. Um, but if you want to uh, if you want to get the feeling of uh, how this works and uh, uh, what uh, what you can do with it, you can you can download this code and and, and we can uh, we can also have a look together. Um, I will stop here.